Good evening and welcome to Edgemont High School's annual financing college presentation. We are really glad that you're here with us tonight. My name is Emily Coleman and I am the newest member of the high school counseling team. And I'm joined today by my colleagues, uh, Jamie Brooklyn and Stephanie Fuentes, as well as privileged to have one of our administrators here, Kyle Hozier. Thank you for joining us as well. Um, tonight, we are thrilled to be joined by the extremely knowledgeable Matthew Malatesta, Vice President for Admissions, Financial Aid, and Enrollment at Union College. He comes to us as a veteran of the college admissions and financial aid process. After graduating from Union College with a bachelor's in arts in uh, managerial economics, he began his admissions career at Hamilton College in Clinton, New York, where he worked for eight years, including three as the director of financial aid. In 2008, he was appointed vice, Pres uh, vice president for admissions and financial aid and enrollment at Union College following a national search, returning home to his alma mater where he is now. So before I hand over the mic to Mr. Malatesta, there are a couple of housekeeping items that I want to make sure we address. The first is that this event is being recorded and will be available on our website after, um, after tonight. It will be available for you guys. Um, second is that where you access this thing tonight, there is also an ask a question feature on the top of the website. Um, on that ask a question, if you if while we're talking, there are any questions that you have, I will be looking through those. And then if we have time at the end, I will um, ask some of those questions. If we don't have time at the end of the presentation, we'll make sure to get those answers to you uh, afterwards. So you're not here to see me. So without further ado, I hand the mic over. I'm going to stop sharing and hand it over to Mr. Malatesta. All right. Hey, it's good to be here tonight. Um, thanks for tuning in, everyone, and thanks for inviting me. Uh, extremely knowledgeable. Might be a stretch here, but um, I'll do my best. I oversee uh, admissions and financial aid at Union. I've done that for a number of years. Uh, as Emily mentioned, I am a recovering director of financial aid, so I've had that experience as well. Um, and uh, so happy to share uh, what I've learned over the years, uh, try to take a big picture view of some of this. So I'm going to share my screen as well. Uh, I've got some slides, which I, I hope will be helpful for you all um, as you uh, go through this process. Um, and again, feel free to feed questions uh, to Emily. And Emily, feel free to interrupt me anywhere along the way um, as we go. Um, I have my slide up, Emily, so let me know if you cannot see it. But if I don't hear from you, I'll assume you can and also assume that it is um, advanced. I can see it, you're good to go. Awesome, great, okay. Um, so this is uh, just a shot from our beautiful campus in Schenectady, New York. Um, happy to be here tonight. Um, and uh, there's some really deep stuff we're gonna be learning tonight. So the, the deep things that you probably are not aware of is uh, we'll start with slide number one, which is college is expensive. All right, that's probably why you're tuning in tonight. Um, so. Uh, you know, ultimately, this is how do you pay for it? And again, I'm going to try to take a big picture view of this um, and also try to be respectful of your time. Um, I know some of this stuff can drone on a little bit. Um, I find the, this this process, the college uh, admissions and financial aid process, the intersection of the two most important things in your lives, your, your children and your money. And there's no value here whether uh, one is more important than the other. I'll leave that between you and your own moral compass. Um, but kidding aside, it's big stuff. It's, uh, you know, big nuts to crack. Uh, colleges are expensive. Um, arguably the most important investment in your children's lives. Um, and so in all sincerity, I wish you all luck as you go through the process. Um, what's the, I'm going to try to tell you some things I just think are important. I'm going to try to talk again, big picture in that. Um, I think some of this is going to be interesting to families, whether or not you qualify for need-based aid. In fact, I'd argue the most important thing you can do here is kind of learn your number, have some sense of how colleges view your financial need. 
not how you value your financial need, but how do colleges value your financial need so you can make the appropriate decisions in terms of the colleges that you're considering for your children um, appropriately. So, so the first thing that's really important to understand is, you know, there, there, are, there are formulas that underlie all of this. Um, not all colleges use the same formula, but there's some major formulas that underlie much of this. Um, you all will be going through this process at a, a, a kind of slightly weird time. We're going to talk a little bit more about that with some changes that are coming to the free application for federal student aid. Um, but you've got to also norm yourself to, this isn't a perfect figure, but the median family income in the United States, the median family income, so right down the middle, is roughly $80,000 a year. That's family income, which, which just means there's a range of economic uh, backgrounds and half the country is below 80,000. So there's a lot of need out there. Um, and you just have to be aware of, of that as colleges are gonna have different aid policies and practices from institution to institution. Arguably, this is what makes the process most difficult because there's not a one size fits all. We're all doing it slightly differently, which makes it challenging. And it's also challenging because I know many of you don't even do your own taxes. Again, no judgment there. It's just the, the factual reality is many people don't do, even do their own taxes. So the fact that these colleges and universities um, ask for a lot of information and for, for some of you, it's the first time you even really dig in deep on what's your adjusted gross income or what what do your tax forms say um and then union does it different than colgate university or syracuse university and, you know we're all asking for slightly different forms it, it makes it complicated um i don't want to be the, the the dream crusher here um but it's kind of uh, remarkable as a society how much we spend on youth sports and I, I've got actually two college athletes right now, shockingly, despite my genetic code. Um, but uh, but there's not, you know, both my kids run one division one, one division three, and uh, not a lot of money in division one running, um, but a lot of fun. And I, I'm, I, I love athletics. I'm a recovering high school coach. Um, but there's not as much money out there for ath athletes as you might think. If you're one of the, the few, great. Um, I read about uh, the, uh, the basketball players transferring from Michigan. He was a little upset because his NIL money was below six figures. Um, that's just not the, the norm. That's definitely the exception. All right, so what are colleges doing? And I'm going to talk both about need-based aid, merit aid, and frankly, there's some stuff even a little bit in the middle. But when it comes to need analysis, the the, uh, the most aid offices have a few kind of uh, things that underpin their philosophy. And it starts with, to the extent you're able, it's the parent's primary responsibility to pay for a dependent child's education. You don't need to agree with that. You just have to go into this process understanding that colleges and universities, you know, approach it that way. So when you say, we don't want to, or we're not willing to, we'll say, okay, well, that's a family decision. You can do that, but our formulas are going to expect a parental contribution. Now, there's certain exceptions to that, but they're pretty bleak exceptions. You know, wards of court, um, cases of complete neglect. You know, there's a variety of things. If you're a part of your children's lives, then we're going to expect the parents to be the primary uh, payer here. And it's the ability to pay, not the willingness to pay. And I don't, I don't say that um, like to be funny. It's just that's that's what's being measured. It's a pretty kind of Cold, some some it's just mathematical um, calculations, and what we're trying to do as a financial aid office, you know, we just recruited our first year class, you know, and spent about uh, twenty million dollars uh, uh, in financial aid. We're lucky to be a college with the resources and the commitment to meet the full financial need of the students we admit. And as I say that, we say we meet the full financial need of the students we admit to the college. That's our measurement of need. Again, it's the, I don't know if every family agrees that we're um, adequately um, measuring their need. But what we're trying to do, even within the, a place with resources in the tens of millions of dollars, is the aid office is trying to distribute the available resources 
in an equitable and consistent manner. It's really about the consistency of following these formulas, um, but it doesn't say fair. This process is not, you know, arguably is, is, you know, there's different winners and losers in it. And I'll talk through a little bit what the formulas are um, so you can understand what underpins the formulas. So first, the formulas are mainly income driven. And so question I get a lot from my friends who have college age kids and like, how do I have my money? Like, how do I uh, get around this? And the reality is for 95 plus percent of applicants who are salaried individuals with kind of, you know, a uh, normal job getting W-2s, nothing overly funky going on with their finances. There's nothing to do. It is, it, it's going to be mainly income driven. Now, this next bullet is like, do not um, base your uh, entire finances on Malatesta's back of the envelope, but just to give you a, a general sense, roughly the formulas, roughly, are taking 15 to 20%. It's progressive. So the more you make, the closer you'd be to 20, the less you make, probably closer to 15. Again, very just back of the envelope, but very roughly, it's saying that, that um, if you make $100,000 a year, you know, you can expect to, the college will say, okay, 20,000 of that will be coming to um, being used for, for college. And now assets are treated much more um, kindly, I guess, is um, generally the rule of thumb for assets is about 5% of the assets. And so people always say like, well, if I don't, you know, I'm being punished because I saved. It beats the alternative for sure. Um, and so savings is really a good thing. It does to 5% clip, reduce your financial aid eligibility, but still beats the alternative of not having any uh, any uh, financing available for college. This is the, the third one is really important. And this is where the, where the heartbreak, there's a couple of parts of this process where the heartbreak really kind of can play in. It's the fact that the formulas don't look, the formulas regularize exempt, like the uh, allowances against the income and the assets. So it's basically saying you're a family of this size, your parents are of this age, this is what we are going to kind of protect and the rest we're going to uh, look at. And it doesn't look at your personal expenses and it doesn't look at your own debt situation. So it, um, it standardizes that. And those can be very tough situations if you have personally higher expenses than most or, or are carrying currently carrying more debt than most. Um, the formulas don't take that, that into account and that can lead to how do you think we can afford this? Like um, with all the debt we're currently carrying. So it's just important you understand that. Um, now, this starts to get into the, the fact of whether you're going to qualify or not for um, need-based aid is I've gone through this process with two of my children. And as someone who's been in, in admissions and financial aid for a number of years, there's a lot I knew about this process. But boy, did it drive home to how powerfully the, the tail of selectivity wags the dog of choice in U.S. college choice. It's just kind of crazy. Like um, there's a certain sense that if you, for some families, I'm sure you are much more reasonable than those on this call, but is like, if this place, you know, only admits 10% of its applicants, boy, it, it must be the right place for my child. and. I am a huge believer that you put your child in a setting where they're going to be challenged, supported, uh, and, and find joy, that that combination will lead to success at that college and will lead to success in their lives. And there's not a magic college or even a magic number of colleges that make that happen. Now, I make my life on telling you that Union College is the only place for students to go and and have a meaningful life, but uh, uh, you all know it, it's about where is my child going to be successful, and so try not to get caught up in. I want to go to the place with the lowest admit rate. Go to the place that's the best match for your student. Now, what will happen is along the way there are things called merit scholarships, and the idea of a merit scholarship for many places is that for their stronger students who are in their applicant pool, they'll be offered money 
um, exclusive of whether they whether you qualify for need based aid or not. Um, you know, our top students at Union, if admitted to Union, will get a thirty thousand dollar merit scholarship, and that is our way to say, hey, I know Amherst College is a great place, but is it really a place that's one hundred twenty thousand dollars better than Union over four years? Um, and so, again, if you can learn your number whether you're going to qualify for need-based aid or not. And if you do qualify for need-based aid, then pursue places that have generous need-based aid. If you're not going to qualify for need-based aid and yet you still want aid, then think about places that give uh, good merit scholarships and a place where your child might be uh, sought after at a place um, compared to another place that might not give any merit scholarships at all or is rejecting an incredibly high number of their applicants on their own. So something to think about um, that the part of all this is you 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 do your planning, so you decide, but I want to make you aware of that. The reality of most merit scholarships, they are about the academic achievement of the child, not how good a kid they are. It's really most, not, not every place, but many places, the academic achievement. And it's the academic achievement relative to the rest of the applicant pool at that college or university. Um, something to think about is early decision has advantages and disadvantages. Um, the, so you wanna think about that. Um, I know some people think like, if I'm applying for financial aid and I qualify for need-based financial aid, I shouldn't go early decision. And I would argue, it depends on the place that you're applying to. At Union, we meet your full need. If you apply early decision or regular decision, your award will be the same. And what happens for us along the way, though, is we're need aware on the margins of acceptance. And so the, you know, the money is still flowing at the early decision stage. Not that we're not that we're not need aware at all at that point, but um, you do want to factor in. I'll talk a little bit more about need aware versus uh, meeting full need in another slide, but. Understand there's pros and cons to early decision. If you are in a situation to um, that you need to or want to compare your financial aid awards between colleges, well, then you shouldn't apply early decision because early decision is a binding agreement that if admitted there, um, uh, that's where I'll enroll. Now, you have an out of that agreement if the college can't meet what you see as your financial need, but you lose the ability to compare. So it's, that, that's really what it comes down to in my mind. All right, so here's just some terms that I think you should know about. Um, one is that not all colleges are priced the same. Obviously, uh, public institutions are cheaper than private institutions. I work at one of the more expensive colleges in the country, worth every penny. Um, not all colleges are committed or have the resources to meet the 100% of the need. Again, I'm lucky to work at an institution that meets full need. Uh, which means we do the calculation. If we think a family can contribute 30,000, we cost 80,000. Um, and then the financial aid package will be $50,000 um, as you go. There are very few colleges and universities that are both able to meet full need and are need blind. That means in the admission process, they don't factor in how much uh, aid uh, uh, student needs, whether they're admitted or not. Some places are need aware, union being one of those. That means on the margins of acceptance, your ability to pay will be one of the factors uh, in the determination of if a student's admitted or not. This is a part where, frankly, I don't think all colleges are, are um, fully transparent, but these are good questions to ask of what the policies of the colleges are. Now, and there's also some colleges that have no loan policies. Now, the loan policies, when colleges say they don't have a no loan policy, that means as part of their financial aid package, they don't offer a, a Stafford loan or what used to be called a Stafford loan, a direct loan uh, from the federal government or an institutional loan. But that, but you still might have to borrow towards your family contribution at that uh, college university. So. Uh, no loan policies don't necessarily mean you won't be taking loans. It just means the financial aid package won't consist of a loan. So applying for aid, 
These are the things that are at play here. Um, the two forms that you'll become most um, aware of is one is called the free application for federal student aid. Now, please understand that is a free application for federal student aid. If you find yourself paying to fill out a thing called the free application for federal student aid, say, I'm doing something wrong here. There's a website, fafsa.com, that actually charges people for that. And um, please don't do that. It's a, it's a free form that you can get on uh, the org sites um, as you go. So make sure you do that. Now, that's the, that is a form that is used by some colleges and universities to determine need-based aid, but it's really started as a form to be about what someone's eligibility for uh, the direct loans or for Pell Grants. Um, but I'll talk a little bit more about that because the FAFSA is changing fairly significantly in the next few months. What many private colleges do that have their own institutional aid to give out. So if they have large scholarship budgets like Union, they use a thing called the CSS profile. It's a product of the college board, which is our friends who also do the SATs and the AP tests, but they have a uh, formula. And it's a little bit more robust of, of a form to fill out, but it helps colleges with their own uh, scholarship dollars dole those out. And I'll talk about the differences in a moment. Some colleges have their own institutional forms. And um, if you're filling out the FAFSA, you can now fill out the FAFSA and use a data exchange tool, which takes your information straight from your taxes and brings it over into the FAFSA. But some places like Union will ask for your W-2s and your tax returns because there are some families with more complicated um, financial situations and will wanna look at business losses, um, some other things that will pick up on some of the schedules that go along with this. The formulas are all predicated on prior prior tax information. So that means this year's tax information is what's being used to disperse during the 24-25 academic year. And so if there's a change of circumstance between 22 and when your students can enroll in 24-25, that's where you need to reach out to the individual colleges to say, hey, I need to update you on some information. Pretty simple formula, that's why I do it for a living. It's just kind of some simple math. It's the cost of attendance of the colleges and universities you're looking at, and they don't all cost the same. Um, even all private colleges don't cost the same. So that the cost of attendance can be variable. Different institutions have different cost of attendance. But the expected family contribution is generally a, 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 the same. It, now, again, every college has a slightly different formula, but for the most part, in terms of are you high need, low need, middle need, that's going to be pretty similar from college to college. If you listen to nothing else tonight, my encouragement is for you to learn what, how the formulas look at your expected family contribution, because that can be a very eye-opening number for families, for good or for bad. I, I had one mother come to me and uh, right down the stretch, right before May 1, and she's like, I just can't believe it, uh, this aid award. And I'm waiting because like the nine people before her were all like, I can't believe you knuckleheads expect this much from us. But this mother was like, I can't believe you're allowing my, you know, giving us this, this many resources to make this a possibility for my daughter. Um, it's so I always say learning this number in April of your child's senior year is just not ideal. You can learn this tonight. Go to finaid.org. Go to the College Board website. There are good calculators. Grab your taxes. Sit down with it. It will take you a little while, but not forever. And learn what's being kicked out for your expected family contribution. Because then you can do the math. Union costs 80. The expected family contribution is going to be 20. That means my aid award is going to be 60. Or union costs 80. The expected family contribution is 110. I'm not going to qualify for need-based aid at Union, but will one of the merit scholarships be good enough for me at Union, or do I need to find an institution that's either lower cost or has larger merit scholarships? Um, and so there's some work involved in this. 
All right. So this is the big change that's happening. This is happening theoretically in December if the uh, government can get its act together on this. But in 2020, there's a thing called the FAFSA Simplification Act. And basically, it's changing the underpinning of the FAFSA formula. Normally, the FAFSA is available in November of a student's senior year. This year, it's going to be December at the earliest. Um, there's a good article here um, that I've included here, if that's helpful for you. It also allows you to see how the formula has changed from what it was to what it will be. The biggest change that's happening. So what happens is some colleges use the FAFSA as their way, basically as their financial aid form and as the underpinnings of their formula. Now, in the past, up till this year, both the FAFSA and the profile, a huge determinant was the number of students who are simultaneously enrolled in college. So I always say the best advice I could give a family was have triplets because you, know, you have three in college at the same time. And the formula is basically saying, OK, you get this chunk of money divided by three. Uh, you only get this, you know a third of it for each of these students in terms of their expected contribution. But in the new formula for the FAFSA, it is going to eliminate the discount for multiple siblings enrolled at the same time. Now, there's winners and losers in that. The winners is, in general, the formula is going to be more um, helpful for families. And it's going to help the families who had three children all four years apart. Right now, each time they march up, it says, OK, you got one in college. And the next one comes up, you got one in college. And so there's going to be winners and losers. What I don't know for you on this call, I frankly don't think even colleges that use the FAFSA as their financial aid form have decided fully yet. but they what are they going to do about that major change in their formulas? That's going to be something that's going to be learned in real time this year. It's worth, as your children select colleges, you know, learn. Is the college using the profile? The union is going to continue using the profile. It's not going to change our formula. But a place that has used the FAFSA as their formula, um, what are they going to do with the fact that you have two in college or that you have zero in college. But that's a important driver, something that you're gonna to have to learn individually from college to college. It will, on the good side, the new FAFSA for all colleges, whether they use the profile or the FAFSA, um, more students are gonna be eligible for the Pell Grant, which is a federal assistance, which will, be, uh, which will be helpful for some families. Those, the Pell Grant is for the poorest families in America. So, or, or families with the lowest adjusted gross income in America. Um, and, um, there's some other things that are changing in the FAFSA, but I think the, the number in college is the most important thing to understand at this point. Now, private colleges, again, colleges with their own sizable resources to give towards scholarships. Because what happens is, you know, a lot of state schools are less expensive, but they don't have a lot of scholarship to offset that. Um, some some places do, but most, most don't. Um, Private colleges, again, depending on their resources and commitment, have different amounts of resources. And what the CSS profile will do is they're going to look at both taxed and untaxed income. The new FAFSA will not be looking at money that's being put into a 401k uh, a, a or a 403b or a, a retirement funds. The, the profile says that we want to know how much income you made this year, both taxed and untaxed. The FAFSA will only be looking at the tax information that shows up on one's federal tax returns. Um, the profile also includes the non-custodial parent. If there's a divorced or separated situation, um, that's the second area of heartbreak I see in this process is and different colleges treat it in different ways. Some colleges will say we only want to know the financial information about the two uh, original parents of a child. Some will say we want to know the situation about the two parents the child is living with plus a non-custodial. And so it's another question to ask if you're in that circumstance, how do you treat this? But it, uh, probably the most saddest conversations I have had with families over the years is where there's a non-custodial who's a part of the child's life but there is a acrimonious situation. There's divorce proceedings. 
and we say, okay, we expect a family contribution of $40,000. And in our underpinning of our formula, we're thinking 20 is coming from the custodial parent, 20 is coming from the non-custodial parent. Uh, but the non-custodial parent says, I'm not giving it. And But we leave those kind of conversations to the family. So it's important to understand how you'll be treated in those cases. Um, home equity in the CSS profile is an asset and that can be a big driver in an area like where you all live. Um, and there's some caps against that, um, but that can be a big driver that can be uh, challenging for people from uh, high house value areas if you've been able to uh, build some equity in your home. But again, the assets are only being assessed at roughly 5%. The income is being assessed at you know 15 to 20%. Uh, the profile also expects a minimum student contribution um, and also looks at um, people's uh, personal businesses um, that are uh, sometimes blind to the past. So, all right, I'm droning on, I'm boring myself, so I'll try to get moving here a little bit. Um, and Emily, if you see anything along the way that you want me to uh, go in more depth about or um, clarify, happy to do that. But that that's basically the formulas that are used, the forms that are used, and the way the colleges are trying to get at it. What will happen is they will derive a need. Again, they'll do the um, calculation, cost of attendance, minus the expected family contribution. This is how much is left over. In the financial aid package, for most colleges and universities, will consist of a federal direct loan. In most colleges, they'll be between $3,500 and $5,500. Now, you do not need to qualify for need-based aid to borrow through the direct loan program. Um, it affects uh, the subsidies on your um, interest, whether you qualify or don't. But any family who's a U.S. citizen or a permanent resident, any child, is able to borrow through the direct loan program. Um, and so you don't even have to be an aid applicant to do that. You have to ultimately uh, um, fill out a FAFSA to do that. But that can be something that happens a little bit down the road as you go. But the way most places will build their financial aid package, they'll say, OK, you've got $20,000 of need. All right, we're going to give you a $3,500 loan. We're going to give you a work study job on campus. Now, that is... Um, basically the opportunity to work on campus. And colleges might say, we think you can reasonably make $1,500 a year or $2,000 a year. And so you start the package, let's say with $3,500 loan, a $1,500 work study job. So, and you've got need of 20,000. And then the rest at a place that meets full need is gonna be scholarship. So at Union, it'd be $15,000 scholarship plus that loan in work study, just for illustrative purposes. Now, again, depending if you qualify or not for a merit scholarship, that will fall in. And if the merit scholarship is larger than the need-based award, that's good news. You'll get, you'll get a bigger scholarship than you would have qualified for. For many colleges, you don't stack your merit scholarship. A lot of merit scholarships will, could be just part of your need-based package. So let's say you qualified for um, $20,000 of need-based aid and also qualified for a $15,000 merit scholarship. At Union, we're going to say congratulations, you get the $15,000 merit skip scholarship and $5,000 in need-based aid. Um, merit scholarships at some colleges, again, not all colleges, but some colleges, are more um, important to families that qualify for um, lesser amounts of need-based aid, um, if that makes sense. Um, and then the need-based scholarship, again, if a place meets full need, again, not all colleges meet full need. So they might even measure your need at 30,000 and they might say, well, here's a $12,000 scholarship. We hope you can find other resources to make this happen. Um, and that's learnable information. I'm surprised by how much time you all spend in our admission offices and how little time you spend with our financial aid offices. And I don't mean that physically, though you can do that when you visit some colleges, 
but online, like after the visit, you know, enjoy the visit, trying to learn more about your uh, aid package, um, either on the website or sending an email to the aid office, just trying to learn, learn what we are. Every college and university now is required to have a net uh, price calculator on their website. And some are better than others, but it is a way for you to have a sense of what would a financial aid package look like for you at that college or university. And so I would encourage you to fill that out at every college or university that is on the short list for your child and, and then follow that up with an email to say, hey, does this sound right? And this, um, I mean, if you see three that all look pretty much the same, you feel pretty good about it. But, um, you know, again, this, these are, this is learnable information that I encourage you to do. Now, if you're bringing large outside scholarships, generally, well, if you're bringing outside scholarships, that's generally a good thing because what most colleges and universities will do is they will forgive the direct loans in the work study part of their package first. So frankly, the first, you know, maybe depending on the college, first $8,000 of outside scholarships might not even affect the rest of the scholarship that the college is giving. It will come just basically saying, okay, we'll take the loans out of your package, we'll take the work study out of your package. And as I already said, you can borrow outside the financial aid package. So don't, don't be, I, when you're comparing financial aid awards with each other, compare how much money you're being given that doesn't have to be paid back. Because you have borrowing options, you have work options that might not be in that aid package. Don't be, don't be, and a fool is not the right word, but don't be um, misled by the loan differentials between financial aid packages, because there are ways to borrow both in and outside the financial aid package. Um, so beyond financing, beyond the award, you can take out additional direct loan eligibility. Uh, you can borrow up to $5,500 your first year. That goes up over your next four years. There are federal plus loans. Um, that families can take out. There's institutional loans. It is really this is a this is where it comes down to the investment for the family. It is um, you know what kind of I, I'm surprised by the number of families who say we are not going to borrow for college. I, I mean I respect it. So you, you all decide what you want to do. Uh, I would argue at some level it's the most important investment of your child's life. And so if they're going to borrow for their first car to say they're not going to borrow for college, again, you, you all decide what you want to do, but you do have to be realistic about what kind of loans are we willing to take out, if any, um, and how much will be, are we willing to have in the student's name? How much are we willing to have in a parent's name? Um, and those are family decisions that you all need to make. Um, seek outside scholarships uh, when available. They're um, FAFSA.web, well, um, FASTweb is a good website to look at there. Those two websites I put earlier with the net price calculators, maybe those just as starting points, they have scholarship uh, options there um, to look at outside resources as well. Um, and then when it comes down to paying the bill at the college, various colleges have different tuition payment plans to spread it out over 12 or 10 or 12 months. Um, just use the financial aid offices as resources. They are filled with good people who are trying to make this possible for as many people as they can. Um, and, you know, use that resource when you can. Now, again, this is another Malatesta of back of the envelope. Like, don't, there's nothing overly scientific here, but think about borrowing. It's just something to think about is how much debt are you willing to take on relative to what um, you're going to be making. Um, again, I'm one who believes that borrowing for college can be a really good investment. I did it as a as a first gen to college. I I uh, was only able to come to Union. I'm a Union alum because of the very generous financial aid they gave my family many years ago. But borrowing was a part of that, um, and it's well, the best decision I ever made. Um, but you got to be responsible about that, right? And you got to be thoughtful about that. And that, again, that's a family conversation to have. There's some good websites out there uh, to look at that um, as well. All right. That is kind of me throwing a ton of information at you um, very quickly. This is weird because this is 
even beyond Zoom, I'm being simulcasted. Um, so I know asking questions isn't completely natural, but I'd love for you to feed questions that are um, aren't overly specific to just your circumstance. Obviously, we've got a, a variety of different people on the call, um, but um, I'll stop sharing my screen though. I can go back and show any slides if it's helpful, but you'll see my ugly mug a little bit bigger. Um, and the what would be helpful to you all um, at this point? So just a reminder that um, there is a form on the website where you're accessing this, where you can ask questions. Um, we'll keep that open <clears throat> a little longer. Um, one question that we did have come in, Matt, was if you can explain what cost after aid is again, um, that would be great. All right. Well, so there's two things. And, and, yeah, I probably should have done a better job of explaining this on the front end. Front end. So the way what, what colleges are doing, they're not going to simply when they're trying to determine your your aid eligibility, they're not simply looking at the direct cost of the college. So they're going to look at what they consider the total cost of attendance. When you see cost of attendance, that is going to be some directly billed costs. What's the tuition? What are the fees? What are the what's the room and board if it's a residential college? You know, so and some places have a comprehensive fee where that's all bu bundled together. But what does that all add up to be? Let's say that all adds up to be seventy thousand dollars. But there are other costs with going to college, like books and supplies. Those are things you're not going to be directly billed for, but your child's going to have to buy them. And so colleges will give an allowance as they do this calculation, saying, okay, you're going to need $2,000 for books and supplies for the year, miscellaneous expenses. Some colleges might be, might also give allowances for people who are traveling across the country for some transportation expenses. So the college is building out what they think the total cost of going there for a year will be. That number can be a little bit blind to you. You can certainly ask the college what they think their total cost of attendance is. I think most places will share that with you. But they take that total cost, which is a combination of build and non-build expenses. And then they give you your aid package. Some of the things in that aid package go directly against your bill. The, the loan will go directly against your bill. The scholarship will go directly against your bill. But the work study will be a paycheck that your child will earn if they work the hours that they're given to work. That will be money that comes to them that they can use either to put towards their bill or they can use towards some of these miscellaneous expenses. Frankly, some of those miscellaneous expenses are the important things like pizza on a Friday night. Um, so there are, and that's what gets a little confusing is the billable costs in aid versus the non-billable costs in aid. Now, what happens in a financial aid award is not all colleges present it in exactly the same way. In my mind, it's very easy to look at when you get your aid awards. How much scholarship am I getting? How much does a place cost? When am I going to pay at that place? What will happen is some colleges will, in your financial aid award, say, and hey, you qualify for $20,000, or hey, you can also get a $20,000 plus loan. Well, you can get that whether the college says it or not. It's not between the, that's not up to the college. That's between you and the federal government. You mean like, so there's things that you want to make sure. Just look at free dollars versus free dollars and look at cost versus cost. Obviously, if your child's going to go off to a college in California, there's going to be additional costs of them getting back and forth. Um, so you got to be thoughtful about what's the whole endeavor um, racking up to. So it's actually funny, Matt. One of the questions <clears throat> was asking more about Parent Plus loans. Can you yeah. explain the Parent Plus loans a little more? It's funny that you just yeah. Said that. Well, I mean, well, because and that's one of the things that, uh, frankly, is a little frustrating because, like, you'll see, like, we see it. <laughs> You said, you know, see a bunch of people come through in April and um, uh, let's say, again, at Union, we meet full needs. Let's say we measure and let's say we measure the need the same as, as college Y. 
At Union, you qualify for forty thousand dollars of of uh, need based aid. We cost roughly eighty. So that means in our financial aid package, you're going to get roughly a thirty five thousand dollars scholarship. You also can get that work studying that small loan, that direct loan, um, and then the other forty is going to come in scholarship, or the other thirty five is going to come in scholarship. But the other forty thousand, that's the expected family contribution, right? That's what the family has to come up with. Some of you, bless your souls, are able to say, fantastic, let, let me write the check. You know, I'll give you half at the first semester, half at the second semester. We're a trimester school. We do it three times. Trimester is much better, but anyway, that's on a whole other topic. Um, no, it's kidding. Um, the, but you've got to figure out, okay, how are we financing that other 40000 Or Again, it's going to depend on your circumstance, but in the way the college is measuring your need. But towards that 40000 what are some of the resources that people use? Some might use a home equity loan. The reality is many people will look at these plus loans, which used to be called the parent plus loan. It's now called a plus loan, but it's a it's a loan through the federal government that um, you can borrow money for, for college. And you want to look at those rates. Um, you want to compare them. There are some private loans as well. There are some years where I say, the plus is better than the private. I don't want to get into being a financial advisor. Um, so I won't be overly declarative tonight about what's the better route to go, but look at the interest rates, look at the protections, you know, look at how these loans are set up um, when you decide how, how you're gonna how you're gonna finance this. Other Great. We have a, a couple more questions, just okay. a few more. Um, can you clarify how step parents come into play in this process? Please? Yeah. yeah, the you're, you're, I mean, like two takeaways that you have to take from this uh, thing. First of all, go to those net price calculators or expected family contribution calculators. Learn your number. Most importantly, learn your number because if you do not qualify for need based aid and you still want aid, then you got to find places that give merit scholarships. Now, unions involved with a thing called making union possible where we try to give some, um, it's kind of like for families that just miss qualifying for need-based aid or just barely qualify for need-based aid. We know there's a lot of families that fall in that circumstance. So there's some some areas in between a little bit, but generally there's that merit pool, there's that need-based pool. There's some places like union that do a little thing in the middle occasionally. Um, but uh, that's one thing to remember. The other thing to remember that's tied to this question is it depends. <laughs> this is like probably the area of largest variability. The way individual colleges and universities treat situations where there are both custodial parents and non-custodial parents due to divorce or separated situations. So every college, I mean, obviously there's plenty, plenty of places do it the same, but some places will look at three parents to be contributing to this if there's three parents in the picture, a step parent, custodial parent, the other uh, parent um, who was involved in the birth or the original adoption. Um, some will only look at uh, the parents, whether it's the two natural parents or the step parent and the uh, other custodial parent. So it really, sadly, it depends. So if you're in that circumstance, and that's where actually where the calculators aren't very helpful because they really look at the, the, the calculators are most helpful for families that have salaried income, married or, or jointly uh, filing parents, um, like the vanilla situation. If you are not in a vanilla situation, then I'd encourage you to take a, a, a first whack at those formulas and then write the aid office and say, we're seriously considering you, but we've got to learn more about this. And I think you'll actually see some colleges are better than others while getting back to you. I think that speaks volumes to the kind of place you're sending your kid to um, as you go. But, uh, you know, that's information you don't want to be hidden from you as you go through the process. Like it's a heartbreaking conversation to go through a process, have your child be admitted to a college, and then realize it's something that you can't afford. Like, again, that's stuff you 
want, probably want to get out ahead of just so you can have, if nothing else, have a real conversation with your child. And I, I kind of encourage you to do that. This is, you know, it's investment, both like, it's not blind money. It's like <laughs> investment. This is something they should understand. Costs money is a serious thing to consider. And that finances should absolutely be an important part of the deliberations as you go. It, it doesn't mean we're going to go with the cheapest option. May, maybe you'll choose to do that. Um, but it, it's certainly going to be a, a factor in all the other important factors that you're trying to determine uh, when you're trying to find the right fit college. Awesome. All right. We have a, a couple more. We're going to close out by eight. Just <clears throat> want to keep track of time. But um, so you something that actually kind of goes with that. Um, can you clarify, are all net price calculators the same? Are there some that are better than others? What is the requirement and how much validity right, so, should you put in them? Okay, so when it comes to net price calculators, this is, um, I don't mean this to be self-serving. So you don't have to use union, but what I find is a college that is meeting the full need of a student based on their formula, those calculators are better than the others because what I don't know is and again not all colleges and find find places they just they've got their own resource decisions to make they might even have limited resources whatever the case may be if a college doesn't meet full need I'm always worried about their calculator because you're like are they being more optimistic in terms of their formula on the thing or less thing you know what I mean like it's a little bit more variable I would say when you're filling those out that's why, like in one of those earlier slides, there was a thing to get at what your expected family contribution would be. That's more generic. Now, not all colleges use the same exact formula from like the CSS profile because there's like different protections. Like some colleges will be, will allow you basically to write off private school um, uh, tuition. Other colleges won't. Some will cap home equity at certain levels others won't. So there are some variations of that. But um, if you either use a net price calculator of a college you know meets full need, i.e. a place like Union, it can give you a good ballpark of like, what's the pure measure of your need. Um, if you do that at a college that doesn't meet full need, it's just a, it's just a little less predictable. But feel free again to fill that out and ask that college, hey, how how good should I feel about this number that spit out? Like we like in our process, we think if you put in the information right, and again, if it's vanilla enough that there's no great tricks here, that the number it prints out should match exactly what we're going to do down the road. Um, you know, I don't want to pretend it's it's perfect, but we try to we try to make it as helpful to families as we can. Awesome. Okay. So if I get a good financial aid package from school A, um, can I use that to bargain with school B? Um, I mean, I, right, I just came off by April. That's like, I get a lot of that. I mean, look, the reality for us is this is, you know, for we're trying to help families afford us. We're trying to attract a class um, for the college. Um, the my advice is like, don't turn it into a bargaining tactic. Like I'm trying to, like, I'm trying to work out a deal here. If you have a conversation with the financial aid offices, we're trying to make this work, you know, and, and we're having a hard time at this. Like, you know, you, it's going to cost us 50 grand at union. And it's going to cost us 30 somewhere else. Um, like we're willing to have that conversation. The reality though is most of the time we know that. Like, yeah, I get it. SUNY Albany is a less expensive option. Like, it's like, like, like so you got to make your choice. Like, that's your choice. The, the, um, or we're getting a large merit scholarship at another college. And we're like, yeah, I, I can, I can tell you exactly how much they're giving you. Um, and that's because they're trying to take our, you know, our applicants are their top applicants, just like we're trying to steal them from Amherst. You know, another college is trying to, get them from union. So like, so much of the time it's colleges know this and it is what it is. Um, it is worth looking at things, you know, does the college match other merit awards? You know, we don't at union. However, if someone says like, I want 
you know, I'm getting more merit somewhere else. It does make us take another look at their of their finances. Like, did we do anything? You know, were we overly aggressive in terms of how we treated them? It's worth a second look. And if we say no, we say no. Um, you know, so it's not like the end of the world if we say no. But what I find is the appeals that are successful are when there's a change of circumstance, that there's something that we learn in that appeal that we did not know when we originally packaged that student. And again, this information is based on prior, prior tax information. So 2022 tax information. If your financial life has changed in 23 or 24, then that will be important or will change in 24. Then that's important information for the college to know. Now, the profile tries to catch some of that stuff on the front end, but it doesn't always get it at all. And so it's the most successful appeals are when there's a real change of circumstance. Um, and or you can't figure it out. Like, hey, Maltes, you say you meet full need. Um, so does um, Colby College. And why is their award so much better than yours? So it's making me scratch my head. It make us scratch our head. Like, let's OK, let, we'll take a look at it. Maybe maybe we've done something wrong. And sometimes it's like, no, I, I don't know. They might have made some judgment that we didn't. But um, but I wouldn't go approach it. Like some families approach it like we're not willing to borrow. Well, I, I already tell you, we, we're expecting you know, you to have your skin, some skin in the game, you know, hey, we're not going to contribute to our child. We're expecting the families to be contributing towards the child. That's your family decision. Um, but, you know, to have a conversation about, hey, we're trying to make this work. Can you help us figure this out? We're happy to have those conversations. All right. Last question. Are you ready for it? I'm nervous. <laughs> okay. So, um, you know, we're talking about prior, prior, and we, you know, we're looking back two years uh, to gather the data. <clears throat> so let's say, you know, I did really well a couple of years ago. I know I'm not, you know, I do the, let's say I do the EFC stuff and I realize I'm not going to get money this year. Well, if I don't apply for the financial aid for my freshman year, um, is that going to impact, affect my ability or eligibility for financial aid in subsequent years? Awesome question. And I think the two words that I've taught you all tonight that I think you can all it find depends. so helpful is it depends. At Union, because we're lovely people, at Union, we're going to let you walk in and apply your sophomore year. And we're not going to say, how dare you didn't do it your first year. But not all colleges do that. So it is definitely worth asking that question. Um, as you go in. Now, remember, I talked about need sensitivity. So before you beat yourself up, for those of you who are not going to qualify for a lot of need-based aid, don't say, oh, woe is me. Say, oh my God, I'm so happy to be that far north of the median family income in the United States. My life's pretty darn good. I have choices. And the reality is any colleges that are need aware, you know, on the margins of acceptance, my kid's a little bit more admissible. Um, so try to look at the bright side in all this. But uh, for that specifically, I would definitely ask the college if they let you, because some colleges don't. They say, if you're not in your first year, you're not in your sophomore year. We're not that way at Union, but that doesn't mean we're better. It's just uh, our policy. Awesome. Well, we we threw a lot of questions at you. You did a really good job. Well, I mean, I, 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 I most important, I have only one question for all of you. As I started the presentation, I'm doing this from home, and I have a usually lovely older dog. He's over here whining away. So I didn't know if anyone noticed me throw a pen, not at him, just near him. I don't know if he was dreaming or what he was doing. So I don't know if that went with with or without notice, but I, there was no no dog harm in the filming of this uh, financial aid presentation. It was <laughs> not noticed at all nor oh then i then then ignore all that can we can we cut that never the then it never happened right <laughs> kyle can you delete that out after <laughs> i'll edit awesome. it no problem well thank you so much for spending your evening with us tonight um this was incredibly helpful um and again this is recorded so if you have friends who are uh, weren't able to make it tonight, they can still access all of this information and learn about how to finance for college. Um, and again, a big thank you from the Edgemont Counseling Office and administration. Um, over to you, Matt. We're really, really, really grateful that you were able to join us tonight.
Yeah, I hope, I hope it's helpful. I know it's a, it's a lot. It's hard. It's, it's, it's a lot, but it's um, like fundamentally in this whole process, you know, it's about finding, I'm a believer and it's, it's about finding the right fit. So I wish you all luck in, uh, on that quest. Great. Thank you so much.